Lauren, you can begin. I'd like to say good evening to the class. Good evening. Welcome to another lecture given by the members of the Southfield Michigan class. This is a school and not a church and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school, was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Southfield, Michigan class was established in 1997. The Dean of the Southfield, Michigan class is Dr. Marvin Lewis, the president is Dr. Edward Yule, and the superintendent is Dr. Jarrell Lewis. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and are not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language had any characters or letters in their alphabet that have produced the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our heavenly father and his son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit 
manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Our primary constitutional objectives and or aims are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstitions, skepticisms, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation of ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan, speak the truth. At this time, we will have a prayer by Dr. Alexis Hamilton from our Southfield, Michigan branch, and scripture reading, Matthews, the 18th chapter, that will be read by Dr. Brandon Craig from our Lansing, Michigan branch. Our readers for this evening's class will be Dr. Paula Brown from our Saginaw class, excuse me, and Dr. Brandon Craig from our Lansing, Michigan class. Dr. Hamilton? Good evening, class. Uh, grateful to be here today. Let us all bar our hearts and minds for a moment of prayer. Uh, we want to thank you, Yashua, for bringing us here today amidst all this happening in the world. We uh, pray that we get some sustenance tonight uh, that we can carry on to, you know, get us through every day and um, in hopes to hopefully spread this gospel to other people that will need it. So uh, in your name, thank you, Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Dr. Craig. 
Hallelujah. I'll be reading Matthew, the 18th chapter. And I'll be reading that from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, and revised by the late A.D. Trana. That's Matthew, the 18th chapter. At the same time came the disciples unto Yahshua, saying, Who shall be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Yahshua called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offense. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into the fire of Gehenna. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go, and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the assembly. But if he neglect to hear the assembly, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a transgressor. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Rabbi, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him, till seven times? Yahshua saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants, and which, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his master commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and entreated him, saying, Sire, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their master all that was done. 
Then his master, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his master was angry, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. That was Matthew, the 18th chapter. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Craig, excuse me, for the prayer and Dr. Craig from the scripture reading. Before we call on our first speaker, we would like to remind the class and participants of our Zoom to please keep their microphones muted and their cameras off until the end of the lecture as not to disturb the speakers that are called on to speak. At this time, it is an honor and a pleasure to call on our first speaker, Dr. George Light. Dr. Light. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> um, I've had something on my mind, so I guess I'm just gonna come out and go with that because that's what Yasha would put on my heart, so. I just want to give a brief explanation of myself prior to, just because that'll lead up to what I want to talk to. But I came in the class in Kingston in 1983, 84, somewhere in that area. I left school in 1996, 97, somewhere in that area. And I, I never did, never did the knowledge of the name change for me. And I say that with with regards to Yasha Messiah, because every day of my life, every time I looked at a tree, I saw Yahweh, I saw the wise, and I saw Yahshua in those trees. So it never ever changed for me that Yahshua was the only hope of salvation I ever had. Now, I never came back to class at that time, but that was still on my heart and mind. So late in 2019, Yahweh put it in my heart to seek class once again, and there was no longer a class in Kingston where I had attended. And I tried looking for contacts and I had no luck. So I did a search for IDMR on YouTube and um, I found that there were classes on YouTube and I was very excited. And one of the first things that I saw when I came back was the controversy over the name. Um, whose name or for all of us was being saved in, saved in the name of Henry C. Kinley. In my heart and mind, I'm saying, what strange doctrine is this? Because remember for 20 years ago, I only, I only knew Acts 4, 10 to 14, that the name of Yahshua the Messiah was our only hope of salvation. And all the trees constantly reminded me that the name was Yahshua. That was the only hope that I had of salvation. So I was confused. So I watched more classes, tapes, and understood Yahshua is still the name of salvation, and this other is false doctrine. So I'm still confused how many people could believe something else other than Yahshua Messiah. And then I am reminded of the Exodus of Moses because we've been going over that quite a bit. I've been hearing it on Southfield and Chicago and all the others. So that stuck in my mind. And I, and I remember Moses brought us out of bondage and out of ignorance and the Exodus. So anyways, what I wanna go over that is real quick because I'm gonna have to be quick to get to everything that is on my heart and mind here just as proof. So in Exodus, it talk, it's, all about Moses bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, the, and I'm gonna to try to go through these and explain what's on my heart and mind. Anyways, so in Exodus 5.1, these are all gonna be presented as questions and I'll answer them myself because in a live class, somebody else could answer them, but because it's just me, I'm the only one that can answer. So in Exodus 5.1, the question is, who went before Pharaoh? And the answer is Moses. Exodus 7.1 says, Moses, 
who was a god before Pharaoh, and that was Moses. And also it talks about who does Pharaoh, who does Pharaoh and the people see start and stop all the plagues? Who do they see doing these plagues and stopping these plagues? The, the 10 plagues that took place. Who instructed the children of Israel about the lamb and the firstborn and the bitter herbs and all that stuff, how to do that? That's Exodus 12, 3. I'm trying to say all the verses so that people will know where to check to make sure I'm being uh, not truthful, but give them the rec witnesses anyways. So he instructed them how to do the lamb, how to do all that. Don't forget all the way along, Yah Moses is given Mo Yahweh all the credit. So then they go out and there's the war going on. So who held up their hands and caused the Red Sea to part, which we have pictured on the Moses chart here. You can see it's his staff. If you read in Exodus 14, 21, it's Moses. The people see Moses holding up his staff. That's who parts the Red Sea. And then who stretched forth their hands and returned the Red Sea on top of Pharaoh and his host? The people see Moses. In Exodus 25, 35, the, they go in the waters, they cannot drink the water because it's foul. And it says, who, the question is, who threw the tree into the bitter water and made it drinkable? Moses. Exodus 16, 8. Uh, who told the people about the manna and the quail? Moses. Exodus 17, 1 to 6. Who, who smoked the rock and and caused water to come forth from it in Exodus 17, one to six, Moses. And 17, nine to 12, when who, when who held up their hands, did Israel prevail at war? That was when Joshua was out fighting. When they held up, Moses held up his hands, they prevailed when his arms became tired, they had to put rocks under it. As long as his arms were up, they prevailed. Um, so Exodus 24, 3, Moses, or Yahweh speaks down the Ten Commandments, and the people say to Moses, Oh, you go up before Moses, or Yahweh. We don't want to hear him. You, you, you speak to us, and we'll hear you. So they didn't want Moses. Uh, they didn't want Yahweh speaking to him. Why? Because the, the mountain was on fire and it quaked and everything else that was going on there. So he didn't want nothing to do with that. So Exodus 24, 17 and 18. If somebody could read that for me, please. That's Exodus 24 and 17. 17 and 18, please. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm-hmm. That's Exodus 24, 17. And the sight of the glory of Yahweh was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, so here Moses, he goes up into the mountain. It's a burning fire. It's on fire. The people are seeing it. They're already scared because it quakes and everything else. They don't want nothing to do with this. Moses goes up there. He's in there 40 days and 40 nights. They didn't see him take food. They didn't see him take water. What? And so go over to Exodus 32, 1, please. Exodus 32 and 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. Okay, so read that again, and I'm just going to interrupt you a little bit as you're going, if that's okay. Sure. Exodus 32 and 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods. 
which shall go before us. He wants them to make gods that shall go before them. Okay. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Hold it. So as, uh, as for this man, Moses, who brought us out. Just finish that last line again, please. Sorry. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. Okay, so here, here they're saying this man that brought us out. They saw him do the plagues. They seen him part the waters. They seen him drown Pharaoh. They seen all of that all the time. Moses is giving them credit. And they're saying to, to oh, this man that brought us out. Again, they're giving credit to the man. My, I'm thinking, uh oh, I thought Yahweh brought them out. And here they're giving credit to the man. So, and so that goes back to my question. Okay, so what's going on? Why are, why are, why are they trying to have Dr. Kinley as their savior? I didn't understand that. I didn't, and, and again, this is bringing me back to the migration and telling me, okay, back here, this man that brought them out of darkness, ignorant, and bondage. After everything that Yahweh did, everything Yahweh showed them, and Moses gave the credit all the way to Yahweh all the time, here they are trying to give the credit to Moses. And they want God's built to who led them out. They want to give the man the credit. So, so that's that's that part of my question and answer. So then we I'm not going to go through Yahshua the Messiah because we know that he did the miracles. He fed the people. He raised from the dead. He did all of those things for everybody to see. He, he did everything. And everything that he did when he did it, he gave the credit only to his father. Now, I don't know if I wrote that scripture down. Uh, no, I don't have it before me. If we find it a little later, that would be great. But I just want to get to so could I just have Acts 4, 10 to 12, please? That's Acts 4, 10 to 10 12. Till, yep, sorry, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Acts 4 and 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yahshua the Messiah of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom Yahweh raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of your builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Okay, so there's no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. That's what I saw when I saw the trees. So now, it, it, coming up to, so now my next question is, who had a divine vision in 1931? Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. Who raised people, people from the dead? Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. Who healed many of illnesses, cancers, all the rest? Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. Who foretold the future, such as with John F. Kennedy, uh, Roosevelt, uh, the Pope dying on June 3rd? Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. Who conveyed the words of Yahweh to us? Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. Who led us out of darkness? Because you, you know the ignorance and darkness we were in. We had no idea of anything with regards to this creation. Our creature, our creator, or his purpose, or his plan, or even any one iota of thought about what our existence was. So Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley definitely brought us out of darkness and ignorance. Who explained Romans 1, 19 and 20 to us? Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. And if you want to know more about the miracles and, and such as what he did, I was looking at the 1967 convention Lecture July 18th, 1967, 7.30 till 10. 
Healings and Predictions Salvation Army Hall. In there, he goes over all kinds of the things that he had done and healed and where to find the records and everything else. I'm, I'm, because here he is doing all these things in front of all these people. And, and now I'm hearing when I come back to class for, or school for the very first time that my savior is Dr. Henry Crawford Kenley. It didn't make sense to me only because I only knew Yahshua. So you go back to Moses, you see they give him credit to the man. You get up here into our day and our age, and they're trying to give the credit to Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley. Now, the only thing I can do from here is get, get from Dr. Kenley in his own words what he says about it. So I went again, transcripts, thank goodness for these, because that's our, that's our witnesses of today. Um, so I'm going to say them out loud, and then I'm going to read a little bit of them so that they're on the recording. The first one that I'm going to quote from is 20 of, 20th of May, 1968, Living the Life, Love of Yahweh by Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley, Los Angeles, California. Audio, audio recording received from Lamar, Lamar Greer, one nine minute audio cassette. Okay. So I don't know if you have them or if you could bring them up as quick as I'm going to talk because I'm talking quick. But on page four, Dr. Kenley's talking and he says, uh, you are set now you can blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Uh, now you can't go by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You cannot go by Bahula. You cannot go by Paul. You cannot go by Peter and you cannot go by Henry C. Kenley. Uh, down a little further, he skips down. So love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever ever believed in Henry C. Kinley. And the audience says, no. You see how stupid we are? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Talking about Yasha the Messiah. So I skip over to page 30. I highlighted stuff so I wouldn't take all the time. Um, divine, that's okay. Divine metaphysical research, that's not going to get it. You have to be in the kingdom of Yahshua. Now that I get it. Somebody says, well, I'm following Kinley. Woman, all right, Dr. Kinley, Dr. Kinley. That's not going to get it. So that was quoting from that, that lecture. Uh, the other lecture is, the next lecture is Yahshua, only mediator or the natural man by Henry C. Kinley. LA, California, 1970. And on page 10, I highlight a little bit here. Now Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now you get this straight. And here's why I called your attention back to it. That whosoever believed in Henry Clifford Kenley, no, the audience says. Uh, and then page 12, it says, was Cardinal Stitch or Cardinal Givens or Cardinal McIntyre or somebody was they crucified you for you? Audience, no. Was Henry C. Kinley crucified for you? No. Now I'm laying it on the line, folks. So that was there. You have to read all these lectures because there's all kinds of stuff in there, but I'm just trying to get to the point. Time goes by so fast and you never know if you're doing slow or fast. So anyways, the last one I have here is the only name for salvation is Yasha Messiah by Henry Clifford Kenley, 10, 13, 74, transcribed by Beverly Allen. Page two, I want you to read Acts of the Apostle, the fourth chapter, and I think it's about the 10th or 11th or 12th verse. I want you to get this straight out this morning. Now, the reason I'm bringing this to you this way is I want you to know that you cannot be saved in the name of Henry Clifford Kinley. I want you to know that you cannot be saved in the so-called Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I want you to know that you cannot be saved in the name of John the Baptist. I want you to know that you cannot be saved, saved in the name of Moses. You cannot be saved in the name of Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, or none of the prophets. You cannot be saved in the name of Peter nor Paul. I want you to know that. I want you to know that 
you are not Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians and Unitarians and Roman Catholics. I want you to know that you can't be saved in those churches. Now, that's not that's why I got up here this morning. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because Yahweh told me to tell you. Now, you either hear it or else be lost. That's the way it is. I am the man that Yahweh sent in the world in the end of this age to preach and teach the gospel to you. I am no smarter than anybody else. And as far as man is concerned, I'm no better than nobody else. Page five, same lecture. Now you listen. I said, ain't no salvation in the honorable Elijah Muhammad. There's no false salvation in Pope Paul. See, and there's no salvation in Henry Clifford Kennedy, and there's no salvation in your power, pastor. Now get that straight. That's if you want to be saved. Now, if you don't want to be saved, just keep right on going like you're going. Now I give it to you straight now. Down on page 10, I skip down. Uh, Dr. Henry Clifford, that's me. No. See, folks, I want to lay this thing on the line to you this morning. I want this foolishness stopped and this ignorance. That was, that's all I'm going to quote out of those. All I wanted to do, folks, was just show you what Yahweh gave to me um, with regards to this and that I wasn't in class for almost 20 years. And the wise in the trees kept me as part of this right. for that long and, and kept me strong enough to know that Yahshua the Messiah was my only hope of salvation. And he eventually brought me back here to where I am today. And he gave me in my heart and mind an understanding of why somebody, because I had that question, why would somebody think that Dr. Kling was your savior when everything that you read said opposite? And he gave me these witnesses to share with you. And all I can say is that uh, thankfully, thanks to our Heavenly Father for the love that he has shown and bestowed upon us. And he may have brought me out of ignorance in the last little while, but everybody that's here, everybody that hears one word of this gospel on YouTube, Zoom, or anywhere else, he's trying to bring you into. So grab hold of that lifeline and thank Yasha Messiah with all your heart and all your mind and pay attention to this every minute of every day. Mm -hmm. Without us. With hallelujah. that, I'm going to say hallelujah, and thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Dr. Light, for that beautiful testimony. Before we call on our next speaker, I want to remind the participants of our lecture tonight that we are calling on participants from the Zoom. If you are not able to speak, simply stay muted or let us know. For our next speaker, it's an honor and a pleasure to call on, also from the Southfield, Michigan branch, Dr. Kim Johnson. Dr. Johnson? Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Hi. Um, it's been a long time. <clears throat> um, it was like the first time actually, but um, <laughs> I just want to say I truly thank in Yashua for allowing me to tune in um, during this time. Um, I really appreciate the remarks from the previous speaker. I really, really um, enjoyed that. I enjoyed that um, encouragement. Um, it was truly needed and it was very edifying to me. So I appreciate Yashua um, speaking through you because um, it was needed. Um, there is a lot going through my mind. Um, I don't know what I'll get out. Um, I just truly, the thing that I can truly say is that um, I love Yahshua. Um, I thank him for keeping me. Um, it's been a rough road through all of this that's going on in this world. Um, it's been nonstop. Um, I've been working all the way through it, um, but he has truly kept me and 
um, my family. Um, so I'm truly um, grateful for that and still allowed me to be able to listen <clears throat> to the lectures. Um, haven't been able to be on as many live lectures on Zoom, but I've been catching the um, all of the recordings from the different branches and um, reading the scriptures as much as I can to try to keep me grounded um, as much as possible and um, just asking him to just keep me, keep me, you know, mentally, physically, um, and everything. So I'm just, I'm truly grateful that, that I'm, I'm here and just, <clears throat> excuse me, and just hearing, the, hearing the brethren and hearing um, the gospel um, live, <laughs> per se, um, is truly edifying to me. Um, so just with those few words, I just like to say just hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And for our next speaker, it's an honor and a pleasure to call on also from our Southfield, Michigan branch, Dr. Diane Atkins. Dr. Atkins. Good evening, class. Um, Good evening. Truly enjoyed both of the speakers. Very edifying. Um, to uh, actually understand what's been said. That to me is, is just, Yahweh has really been giving me a lot more understanding. I'm so thankful for that. And um, can someone get me the scripture, um, John 15 and 16, please. That's John 15 and 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and mm. ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whosoever mm -hmm. ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Thank you. That scripture um, is so powerful to me because I was in the world thinking I was doing something. I thought I was, I was doing what I was supposed to have been doing. I didn't know. <laughs> and I didn't even know that I didn't know. So um, I'm so thankful to been chosen. We've been chosen. I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. I wouldn't have thought about, you know, I'm walking around calling our creator, Lord God and Jesus Christ, as a lot of us did. But I do know the name is Yahweh. That's his name. Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua Messiah. And as the first speaker said, Yahshua Messiah, that's the only name you can have. Salvation is only in that name. It's not in no, no other name. I'm so thankful that Yahweh has given me an opportunity and, and, and took me out of that darkness um, and it showed me that. And only Yahweh can do that. Uh, oftentimes we say that, you know, we're not, we, we, don't, we don't come here just by chance, just by accident, somebody, you know, you have to be chosen. You have to be chosen. And I'm so grateful and thankful because he didn't have to choose me. He didn't have to choose any of us, but he's chose us to come. And I'm so grateful for that. And I, I, um, I'm happy to know that Yahweh has given me a, a better understanding. I told my daughter when I was in, in the church world, I didn't study anything. I didn't, I didn't know what to study. And, and she, she told me, because what, what, they didn't know. They didn't know what to give you. But since being in, I've never looked at the Bible and looked up scriptures and, and the aims of the school. There was no aims in church, just bring your money and 
and listen to what I got to say and go home. We have actual aims, actual aims you can go by. Um, can you recite the fifth aim for me, please? The fifth aim is to extirpate current superstition, skepticisms, and ignorance. Isn't that something? Extirpate. I mean, <laughs> we got to get rid of our own, our own minds. Our minds are, are, are dead without Yahshua the Messiah. And um, I, I, I just didn't know that. And I'm so thankful that I know now. I have to let Yahshua, I have to, I have to ask him to give me what he wants me to have. Um, and the, um, and it's amazing, it's amazing. There's so many things going through my head. Uh, and I just asked Yahshua to, to calm me down and sit me down and help me understand. Because without understanding, you dead, you have nothing. If you don't understand a thing, you have something that you don't understand. I'm so thankful to know that he can give me that understanding. I'm so grateful for that. Um, and to take me out the way. I have to be taken out of the way. He has to chip, chip. He's been chipping and chipping and getting all of that worldly stuff out of me. Cause you know, you can't be in a spiritual age living worldly. It doesn't go together. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't connect. Yes, we live in this world, but in a spiritual age, a spiritual age that we're in, you can't, you can't, you can't think worldly. And it's not easy. It's not easy to, to just let the world go. You can't let it go, but you, Yahweh can just chip away. He can show you things that you never seen before. And I'm so grateful and so thankful for that. I appreciate um, having the opportunity to say something. And like I said, just knowing the name Yahweh, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's more than anything that we ever got in the, out in the world. Knowing that name Yahweh and asking him to give you an understanding, to learn of him. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to learn of him. That's all he asks. He's not asking us for nothing. He don't need nothing from us. But to learn of him and have faith, ask him for it. Ask him for it and he will give it to you. And he will show you what Yahweh's purpose and plan is. He, has a, he had a purpose and plan. He wasn't all here willy nilly doing whatever, you know, one day he God, one day Lord, one day he's Yahweh, oh, Yahshua, he, that, that's him. And, and, and we have to recognize that. I had to recognize that. And Yahweh has helped me. And I'm so grateful for that. And with that, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity once again. Um, and I'm going to yield the floor and say hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for the beautiful testimony, Dr. Atkins. And for our next speaker, it's an honor and pleasure to call on also from our Southfield, Michigan branch, excuse me, class, the president, Dr. Edward Yule. Dr. Yule? Good evening, class. Good evening. Always a pleasure to give a testimony of the things that have been shown since coming down here and studying in this class. And I just want to say I was highly elated from the um, Tuesday's tape that we heard of Dr. Kenley, which he clearly pointed out that there's no salvation in anything else than Yahshua, and that the things that are going on in the world, which when he spoke about them, the things that really stand out to me right now in the, looking at the natural to understand the spiritual is how polluted the world is. And as Dr. Kinley stated, the air is polluted. The land is polluted. The water is polluted. Our governments dictatorships and so-called democracies are just also polluted with lies and hypocrisies that deceive 
the whole world. And on top of it, we're suffering a pandemic, which um, people have all types of analogies and speculations on where it came from. And we know that we have a creator that creates all things. Uh, we can show that in um, Isaiah 45 and 5, and then get uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. So we have a creator that the world doesn't recognize exists. They think that man is doing things like creating pandemics and um, some of the fallacies that go with the so-called um, theories that speculate on why we're getting vaccinations. And one of the worst that I've heard is that the um, people that are afraid to get them indicate that they are putting microchips or they can transfer you and your body and all kind of crazy things like that. And one of the things that people fail to realize is that uh, they wouldn't have to put a microchip in a vaccine because everybody with cell phones, they already have a tether on the World Wide Web, you know, the contact. That's right. So, you know, there's no place to hide. And it's even like, um, People just give Yahweh short hands, but um, failing to recognize that he's the creator of all things. And so let's get that, um, start out with that Isaiah. Isaiah 45 and 5. Mm -hmm. I will give thee the treasures of darkness. 40, 45 and 5. 45 and 5. I am Yahweh and there is none else. Okay. There is no Elohim. Beside me. Yeah, and so we have we have right up here that's Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. So um, he's speaking through a vision through Isaiah, letting them know I'm Yahweh and there's none else. And read. There is no Elohim beside me. Mm -hmm. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am Yahweh and there is none else. Mm -hmm. I, form, mm -hmm. I form the light and create darkness. Okay, so now he's the creator. If you look at it in a nutshell and it's spelled out in John, first chapter, Genesis, first chapter that before anything could be created, there has to be a creator. In other words, things just don't come from a bang theory or the way that man thinks the creation was, but it's spelled out clearly uh, by men that he gave visions to, to spell out what happened. So here he's telling Isaiah what he is capable of and what he has done, read. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Yahweh, do all things. In other words, all the things that are going on in the world today, the creator, he caused it to happen because it's his creation and it's according to his will and his good pleasure, everything that's going on. So get over there in 46, nine and 10. As 46, nine and 10, remember the former things of old for I am- pages in dispensation. Mm -hmm. Remember the former things of old, for I am Yahweh and there is none else. I am Yahweh and there is none like me. So let's look at here. He's creation. In other words, the other scriptures talk about the creator. He created light and darkness, but the creation, the whole creation abides within Yahweh or eternity. You can't get outside of this, of Yahweh and look back and say, oh, he's inside of the creation. No. Everything is within him that seen and not seen. In other words, it's his creation. The whole universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh or eternity. So um, 
you have to see if there's the things that we have been taught is called time. So we are measuring time by what uh, men have come up with, but Yahweh put in the scriptures what his creation was about his, in that day of the creation, or where he talked about it in the day he created the creation. Um, just get that real quick in Genesis. I think it's the third chapter. In the day, I know in many of Dr. Kinley's uh, texts, and there's one from 1958 that I see a lot on television where he uh, talks about the day in the day that of this creation so that he did, eternal day has no measure of time the way we've been taught calendars, clocks, all of that is just measure unto man. So you got lunar, you got uh, Julian, you know, the, all types of calendars that have been used in history and they all uh, cannot measure the time of Yahweh in the terms of his eternity, how when it began, when it will end, only he knows that because it's his creation. Did you get that uh, Genesis in the day? Genesis okay. three and five. Okay. For Elohim doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as El, knowing good and evil. It's the beginning of one of those chapters like yeah, the beginning. That's Genesis. This is um, in King James Version. That's right. In the day. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Genesis 2 and 4. It may be Genesis 2 and 1 in the Holy Name Bible, but King James Version, Genesis 2 and 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, created okay. in the day that Yahweh Elohim made the earth and the heavens. Okay, so in the day, in other words, that's in the beginning, the angelic and the physical all came about in that first age, creative age. And so the whole thing about a day is that the world is looking at a day as starting at 12.01 or 12.01 AM. They don't look at it as it was spelled out 360 days a year as in the original Hebrew calendar. So the time that goes back there and the uh, Julian and Gregorian calendars, uh, that time is not skewed to be exact. In other words, we use 365 leap year. And so all those calendars just keep a time based on the information that when they started going from uh, Julian to Gregorian and using a lunar versus the lunar being 30 day months versus the way that the calendars are set up now. But in this day of eternity, when he created man, just read that one more time. Start at one there two, in that two and one. These are the generations. Okay, this is, sorry about that. Oop, lost my place. Genesis, here we go. Two and one, King James Version. Now, this is Moses' vision. See, that's another big thing. Uh, I look at Yale University has theologians that go try to explain the Bible, and they talk fast, and uh, oh, they have everything wrong. It's amazing what they're teaching college theologians to become ministers um, about even going through each chapter of the Bible. And when they got to this creation part, they're confused on the from here and then in the fifth chapter. I don't want to go there. I want to get back to uh, Yahweh and uh, remember the things of former things of old. But go ahead and read that real fast. Genesis chapter two, King James version. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, Elohim ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all so, his work. So that's why I wanted to get show you that all of these ages and dispensations, and like we pointed out in the uh, first stage, the antediluvian age, post-diluvian age, the present kingdom age, uh, the fifth age, 
and the sixth and seventh are combined in that day of eternity. And that's all. They got the scripture right up here to show you what Dr. Kendall was talking about in that last day of eternity, Genesis 2 and 4, which she's reading up to. And so people are thinking in college level, I'm talking about theologians, they thinking that's a day that went back and they thinking that this was passed on from someone's daddy down to their son. And in other words, they think that genealogists wrote back there. They can't see Moses having a vision to write about how the creation was started. But can't finish that up real, real quick and then go get Isaiah 46, 9. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, sanctified it because that it, it he had rested from all his work, which Elohim created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In so, that day. Okay, so in, in the day, the day of eternity, when all of these ages were created in, in Yahweh's time. So, but here we have a vision given to Dr. Henry Cliff Kennedy to look back and check and balance, just like those Daniel's uh, 400 and, um, 490, four, you know, 490, 70 years going times seven being 490. And that was a prophetic vision that, that uh, he was having in the whole chapter of, of um, ninth chapter, 24th chapter of, of Dan, of, I'm <laughs> sorry, the, the same one that Dr. Kennedy covered, but at any rate, um, 70 weeks are determined, and those 70 weeks, um, get that real quick. I just want to have a real quick comment about Daniel 9, 24, 27. That's just the way it's been. This is something I had recently took Daniel. notes and had been studying it before we had that, that Dr. Kenley went through uh, Daniel 9, 24. Daniel 9 and 24. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Okay, so what, what he's saying in, in his vision that he saw the city, and this is like 500 some years before it, it took place. Being Jerusalem, he saw the people being those uh, Jewish nation that were at that time, if I'm uh, correct, that they were in uh, Babylon. And um, this most holy was Yahshua, which was referred to in 924. So, and they indicated that they would finish trans, to finish or restrain transgression. What verse is that in? Uh, where are you reading? What he say is gonna restrain or finish transgression. That's 24. Okay, so that finished transgression, Isaiah 53, 8 through 12. That's Isaiah 53 and 12? 8 through 12. 8 through 12. One moment. Isaiah 53. 8, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt, excuse me, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall pr prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be sat satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant 
justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And that was finished transgression or restrained transgression. It's also in John 19.30 where he was crucified and say uh, it's finished. But then at the end of sin, uh, that time of the end of sin is already uh, fulfilled because when uh, in John 129 and John 136, uh, John the Baptist said, the next day you see him say, behold, the Lamb of Yahweh. And so that's another place of witness of the end of sin. In other words, he was that Lamb to put an end to sin. And this is what Daniel is prophesying uh, 500 some years before it really actually happened. So then if you look at what put that gospel that put the end of sin, you look at 1 Corinthians 15, behold, uh, get that real quick, the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 Moreover, brethren, uh -huh. and 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. But, but also which you are saved, if you keep in memory, so that gospel, in other words, um, by taking away the law and ushers taking and pouring out the Holy Spirit to the Jew on the day of Pentecost, seven years later, to the uh, Gentiles, uh, put an end to sin and transgression where Yahshua, and that's on the uh, carnal ordinance chart, but uh, get Hebrews 8, 9 and 5, where he was offered once. In other words, put an end to sin. Just, just read that uh, Hebrews 9 and 5. That's Hebrews 9 and 5. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. You want Hebrews 9 and 5? In Hebrew, yeah, the ninth chapter where it said he was, well, the high priest went in many times, but he was often oh, one. All right, so we, um, Hebrews 9 and 1. Yeah. Whoever then, says it, yeah. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory sh shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of Yahweh. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Spirit that's signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Is that where you want? Right, yeah, keep on. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sac sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, who stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now, is there a sentence says that the but high priest Yahshua was offered once? Yeah. For all. Just uh, that one. Let me see. Uh, this is it. Well, this may be Hebrews yeah. nine and twelve. Thank you. Hebrews nine and twelve. Neither. Well, I might as well keep going. But Yahshua being come and high priest of good things to come. Okay. Now that's putting the end to sin, as Daniel was prophesying. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Keep going. Being a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made by not made with hands that is to say not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and, uh, and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sacrificed to the purifying of the, of the flesh. So, so uh, all, these, all these carnal ordinances, I'm showing that Daniel is prophesizing about how he would put an end of sin. And this is the other, like Isaiah confirmed it, a finishing transgression. And then you got here in the uh, fulfillment, even Daniel, Daniel 12 and 4. Um, and, and that's another scripture. In other words, that show an end of sin. Now, the other thing in that same Daniel prophecy is the reconciliation or atonement. And uh, you can just uh, pick up uh, Romans 3.21 and 3.22 for reconciliation or atonement. Romans 3 and 21. But now the righteousness of Yahweh without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You see, you see again, you're going back to all those things that were in the, in the uh, cardinal ordinances was actually fulfilled, but just the reconciliation, keep reading. 22, even the righteousness of Yahweh, which is by faith, the faith of Yahshua the Messiah, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Okay, so now after his death, burial, resurrection, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that law is written now in your heart and mind, as it says in uh, Hebrews 8, and chapter 8, and then uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. And just get it started, Hebrews 8, and uh, about start about 8. That's Hebrews 8 and 8. There we go, sorry about that. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, say Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith Yahweh. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my laws in, into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a Elohim and they shall be to me a people. So and they shall not- Let me just interrupt you right here. So under the law, um, people had to do something, but under faith, having faith that Yahshua has did a good enough job for your salvation, that's what you have to believe, that he did the job. He paid the cost to be the boss to save your soul. In other words, they had to do things. In other words, but Gentiles, and it's telling you right here that the house of Judah and the house of Israel, those are the two divided 12 tribes, 10 in the north, Judah and Benjamin in the south, and they were the ones that this new come. Just read that last sentence again. Read where you were. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said Yahweh. I will put my laws into their mind and write them into in their hearts, and I will be to them a Elohim, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Okay, that's good enough there. Okay, so uh, where I'm headed now, like that's atonement and reconciliation, but the sentence that says in Daniel, um, nine going all the way up to 27 everlasting righteousness um, that's second corinthians 5 21 second corinthians 5 you said yes uh-huh second corinthians 5 and 21 
for well, he, he hath made. For well, he was our sin for us, the everlasting righteous. Okay. Did you want me to read that read, after you? Yeah, read it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Yahweh in him. So that's just another summary of how by nailing all these carnal ordinances and things that never were given to Gentiles, he ushered us to this side of the cross where the New Testament is written in your heart and mind. And so you look at your heart and mind, your spirit, soul, and body. You want your spirit connected to Yahshua, your soul. You want your soul to be saved in his glorious body so uh, that everlasting righteousness is in him now so he's going to seal up that vision now that uh, two things about the uh, and this still in Daniel's reading in Daniel uh, Luke Luke 24 and 25 really seals up the vision of prophecy and revelations 19 and 10 Get Revelation 19.10 first, the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19 and 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see Now you thou. see when I'm going right to these scriptures, the rest of the story is either precedes it or is afterwards. But I'm just getting right to the point of sealing up the vision of the prophecy. And um, in other words, this was a prophetic vision. Um, and in that, where you talk about the, the, the first prince that destroyed the temple, that was uh, Titus, who he was a prince because his dad was the emperor of uh, Rome, Octavian. That's in the scripture too, but that's too much information to get, get into. But to seal up the vision of prophecy, uh, get Revelation 19, 10, and then Luke 24, 25. And then I just have a couple more to do, and I'll finish up. Revelation 19, 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Yahshua, worship Yahweh, for the testimony of Yahshua is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the spirit of prophecy. In other words, all of those divine visions and revelations, all the way up into Dr. Kennedy's divine vision and revelation, that gives us confidence, gives us faith to know, be able to separate a truth from a lie. And so um, Daniel also, and talk about anoint the most holy. Now, Yahshua Messiah was anointed by John the Baptist at age of 30 to start his ministry. Uh, just pick up uh, Isaiah. 61 1. And then the next reader get Mark 1 and 23. Is that Isaiah 61? Yeah, 61 and 1. And read fast. I only have a few minutes left. Isaiah 61 and 1? Yes. The spirit of Yahweh Elohim is upon me because Yahweh hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. Let me continue. Yeah, that's good there. Now get um, Mark 1 and 23 to 25. Mark 1 and 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Yahshua of Nazareth? Are thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of Yahweh. And Yahshua rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. Okay, that's that spirit. You know, Yahshua Messiah, the Most High, at the beginning of his ministry, and then he went through expelling demons out of men. Uh, and get a look for... No, good Acts 10 38. Acts 10 38? Yes, uh huh.
how Elohim anointed Yahshua Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now you hear that? Read that one more time. How Elohim, Yahweh, anointed Yahshua of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So he had power over all flesh. He had power over all things. He was in the world. The world was created by him, the same Yahshua that's up there on the cross. And like the, one of the previous speakers said, it's impossible to see anyone else be your savior other than him, his blood, the only blood is worthy. And so all the foolishness in the world of saying there's a savior other than Yahshua should just listen to what uh, is being stated right here. Read that Acts 10.38 again. That's Acts 10.38. How Yahweh anointed Yahshua, the, Yahshua Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for Yahweh was with him. And we are witness of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Mm -hmm. Him Yahweh raised up the third day and showed him openly. So he went around 40 days openly. The witnesses, hundreds of people saw him. In other words, and that's recorded history. They want to hide this from you, but we know this for certain that this is what happened because we got witnesses upon witnesses, read, and then a vision that don't lie. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of Yahweh, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of Yahweh to be the judge of quick and dead. The only judge. Uh, get, get real real quick, Acts 10, 20, I mean, uh, 24 and 28. Who's going to judge the world in righteousness? And that'll be it for me. Acts 24. Uh, is it 17 and 28? Uh, yeah, Acts 17, 28. Well, you're going to judge the world in righteousness. That's toward the last couple of sentences. Acts 17 and 31. Okay. Because he hath appointed a day in, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness and this by that man. That, that we see in vis visionary form on the cross, but now in spirit, he's going to judge the world in righteousness. Just read that one more time, Brandon. 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So that's the assurance we have. In other words, nobody resurrected, seen for 40 days, 10 days later gave his spirit, then seven years later poured out his spirit, and that Holy Spirit still going on right today with those two words i thank you hallelujah hallelujah thank you for that beautiful testimony dr yule and for our next speaker it is an honor and a pleasure to call on dr philip crook from our saginaw class dr crook good evening class good evening <laughs> It's always a pleasure to give a little testimony about our favor, Yahshua. I was listening to the previous speakers, and each one of them was speaking about how edifying it was to hear this great gospel. So I got to looking up. Can somebody look up edifying? Because when you hear this story, and when you know the gospel of Yahshua, the true gospel of our Savior, it is very edifying to know the what he did for us. I apologize. You like the definition? I'm, I apologize. This is taken from West, Webster um, Online. Edify, to instruct and improve, especially in moral and religious knowledge, uplift, Build, establish. Synonym is 
educate, enlighten, illume, illuminate, illume, inspire, nurture. So it's illuminating this and enlightening us, giving us an understanding to uplift you. It's uplift, very uplifting, you know, to receive a spiritual knowledge of righteousness of your Savior. When you look at all the things that's going on out here in the world, and if you get caught up in the world, sometimes I see a lot of people, you know, they get very distraught, you know. I'm hearing people having migraine headaches, and they say they never used to have headaches because of some of the things that's going on, especially with this pandemic, with the coronavirus, people losing loved ones. And this ain't nothing but like a, one of the plague, the same plague, just, just, it's just the same as that plague that was put down on Egypt. You know, you used to hear people, I know when people listen to those stories about what happened down there in Egypt with the children of Israel, people used to say, I can't see how they were so hard-headed. You know, I wouldn't have been that hard-headed. I would have did everything God told me to do. God wanted me to stay in, I would have stayed in. But here we are right now. We're going through a pandemic, and you have people that can't even wear masks. You know, they, they can't just to, um, save someone, save not only their life, their loved one's life. And so you look at all this, and you realize when you look at all this, looking at the world, getting caught up in the world, there's some things that, you know, if you don't really know your Savior, you'll be lost. But people die. Losing friends, loved ones from a virus within the last year. This 2021 pretty much came in 2020. And I don't know how many people that lost some love. I, I know several, several family members, and even within my own family, that they lost people through this virus. Way more, you know, than anything I ever known anybody dying of. But yet you still have people being hard, not wanting to wear the mask. You got to have some discipline. You know, it takes some discipline to do things that you're supposed to do, to do the right thing. And one thing, Yahshua, when you learn about your Savior and he got you in the righteousness, he started making you right. He started getting you right, making you do things you normally wouldn't have done on your own. And all you got to do is just look at the world, look at what's going on. I think Dr. Kinley once uh, said, you know, you want to see what's going on. You want to tell when the end has come, just watch the news. He said, watch the news and watch your surroundings. Look at what's going on out there. Then see where you at when you are in here in class, being obedient, coming to class, learning of your career, not getting caught up in these things, doing the things that you're supposed to do. And one of the things we're supposed to be doing now in these days and time is coming to class, learning about our savers. Nothing more important. I can say that over and over again because it's very edifying. It's uplifting to know that I'm not caught up in the world through this preaching of this gospel. Although we are in this world, we still got to do some things from a natural standpoint, but we're not caught up in it. We know there's going to come a time when we, we're going to take off this flesh. And when we take off off this flesh is all about where your soul gonna go when you die. You either go into heaven or hell. And when you know your savior, Yahshua, when you know his story, when he's telling your story in righteousness, he got you and you hear people give that testimony. It is very edifying. It's very uplifting to know that I'm not caught up in this world. Cause what I see out here in the world is chaotic. <laughs> As long as I got Yahshua, I'm not in that chaotic state because of him and the things he done. And it's always a pleasure just to say a little thing. And I, with that, I'm going to just yield the floor and say hallelujah. Give all praises to Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And for our next speaker, it is an honor and pleasure to also call on from our Southfield, Michigan branch, Dr. Shirley Nelson. Dr. Nelson.
Good, good evening, everyone. Good evening, class. Good evening. Uh, I was um, enjoying all of the speakers tonight. I really enjoyed class and the things that they had to say. They, as the previous speaker just said, they all stayed on the same line in regards to needing a savior and looking into Yahshua. We, um, we have been so blessed at this particular time of the world to happen to be those who have been given an understanding of our creator and recognize his wonderful salvation that he has already given to us. Um, I wonder if someone can go over the, I have been reading earlier today, uh, listening to the different things and, that are going on in the world. I wonder if someone can just go over and pick up the textbook. Yashua had me go through and read this portion of the textbook again. And I think that's over there in volume one. And I know you know where I'm going with it because everybody kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, that's the preface preface of the um, volume one there. If you can read it, start up there at um, where it starts, the first paragraph starts with likewise. Because the only thing I was, Yahweh was showing me earlier today, I was listening to some scriptures in my car. And then I was, uh, I was reading this, I was, you know, thought to read this book, you know, reading the we, I, we're still work at my job and we have, you know, conversations sometime. And just as the previous speaker has said that we are all, this world is already in a state and everybody is in a particular state. And Yahweh is just making us more aware of the fact that we need a savior. Now this is gonna be, I see you're trying to find it on there, but this is the preference in volume one is after, it's right in the beginning, after acknowledgements and so forth. If you go over there and it's the second page of the uh, preface before the basic psych psychological preparation is before that, before the table contents. I found oh. it, Dr. Nelson. Okay. So it's the second page of the preface in volume yes. one. Mm -hmm. Okay, likewise, the political organizations of the world have suffered decline and embarrassment and frustration. Now, I'm not reading the very first part of it, but you can read the first part of it. And Dr. Kinley in his book, as we know, Dr. Kinley had a divine vision and revelation that he said he received from the creator himself. And he was told to put these things down in a book. Now he wrote this book many, many, many years ago, but yet and still we can read his words just as we listened to his words the other day uh, the last class here in Southfield and one, one of the transcripts that was being read. And you can apply even those things that he talked about then to today, if you will. I mean, a lot of when he talked about the world conditions and so forth. But now he's saying over here, likewise, the political organizations. And so like I was ready to say, when I'm working at a job, you know, people are always into some kind of political this and political that conversations, if you will. But go ahead and read, if you will, Brandon. Likewise, the political organizations of the world have suffered decline and embarrassment and frustrations. Countries have gone off of their gold standards and faced economic ruin, while other world-renowned governments have been stubbornly resisted by small, insignificant countries in armed conflict. Political heads of government have stepped down from their high posts in disdain or being ousted or assassinated and civil strife in the streets and on the campuses of universities is rampant, with no one having any answers as to why these things should be or as to the ultimate end of these upheavals. Nations have armed themselves to the teeth with devastating and destructive nuclear weapons and are nervously watching one another in order to be the first to push the button to release these terrible instruments of war or they fully realize that the one that strikes first would have a decided advantage. So we all sit like ducks on a dry powder keg awaiting the inevitable spark that will blow us all into total oblivion. Continue. 
To further add to the chaos and confusion in the world, there is strife and bloodshed between racial groups. The blacks versus the whites, the yellows versus the reds, the Jews versus the Arabs, etc. Brother is fighting against brother, father against son, mother against daughter, the young against the old, and everywhere there is utter chaos and disorder. The Jew-Arab situation seems to be the classical example of such conflict, and it is potentially explosive enough to lead the whole world into armed aggression. Neither the Jewish nations or the Arab nations will even mention that Yahweh, in his ultimate purpose and plan, gave the land of Canaan, over which they are now fighting to both nations as an inheritance. Yes, and now even that, as the previous speaker, one of the speakers had mentioned, nor will they acknowledge the fact that Yahweh has a purpose and a plan. There is nothing that's out of order today. I'm saying these things, I know we have just a little time, but I wanted to say these things because it's confirming to me that Yahweh has placed us in the right place at the right time. And if we can believe and remember, remember Yahweh's words, remember what he's taught us. He has a purpose and he has a plan. And I want you to go over there and get it again, Isaiah 46 and nine, I think it is, um, if you can start there, or 10, wherever it starts. But he has a purpose and a plan. But before you get the scripture, I want you to go on and also read, just jump on down to the last paragraph, if you will, uh, Brandon. It is in the climate of the above mentioned conditions that this second edition of Elohim, the archetype original pattern of the universe is being published. And hopefully we are endeavoring to reach the masses of the people who are in the doldrums of despair and hell. No, there can be no drawing back from the inevitable destruction of the world for Yahweh has purposed it to be so. Now listen, Dr. Kenley, who he says he had a vision from Yahweh himself. He said there is no drawing back from the inevitable. That means it's going to take place is already purpose, is already put in motion. Inevitable destruction of the world. Why? For Yahweh has purposed it to be so. Go ahead, read. But it is possible for one to free himself from the bondage of sin and ignorance and to come into the ark of safety and the glorious liberty of the sons of Yahweh. Now, it is no mistake that he used those, that verbiage of the ark of safety, because you have a principle of that in the scriptures. You saw evidence of that particular manifestation with Noah. And all those that was in the ark was truly only those that survived when Yahweh destroyed the world back then. He that was a time period that he had already purposed because he had looked upon mankind and saw that the very intent of his heart was evil and evil continuously. Now we know that Yahweh declared the end right from the beginning. So we have the self same situation here, but even then that ark was just, it was a principle that he was setting up to show you that the reality of the ark, the true ark is Yahshua the Messiah. We have the opportunity to be in the ark of safety. And so he says here, see, you can escape the bondage of sin and ignorance and come into the ark of safety in the glorious liberty of the sons of Yahweh. Please continue, just finish that last paragraph. No one in his right mind could think that the world is going to go on and on and that eventually peace and harmony would prevail for this has never been the case except for very short periods of time since man has been upon the face of the earth. It is the mercifulness of Yahweh to provide a way of escape out of this doomed world, and we should be eternally grateful to him for this precious salvation. Absolutely. Hallelujah. And I'll see, I was so thankful to Yahshua that he even gave my, gave, put in my mind to read that again, because it was important to see that, see, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Recognize where you're at and that where we're at at this time in our lives, see, we are in Yahshua, the Messiah. 
who is able to keep us during, during this time that we're in. He is our only hope of salvation. This is not the time to walk away, to be neglectful, to be passive about this gospel. Oh, it's there, is that it's not the time. The time is to rededicate ourselves. The time is to find out how Yahshua has done it and where we stand in him. That's what he's saying to me. See, now when you go over there to the scripture, and I just want to follow up with that, have it read over there in Isaiah again, over at 46, if you will, and you can pick it up with the train of thought. I can't remember how it starts over there, please. That's 40, Isaiah 46 and 9. Okay. Remember the former things of old. Mm. For I am Yahweh and there is none else. I am Yahweh and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now this is Yahweh's pleasure. See, this is what he's resonating in my mind. This is not about you, Shirley. It's not about your job and your wants and your needs. It's not about any of that. This is about Yahshua. This is his story. See, he did, you know, oh, I tell you, there's so many things on my mind. But Yahshua had, Yahweh had this purpose and his plan that he just drawn, drew out. See, and caused him to manifest down through the ages and through the dispensations. I've been listening, I told you about, you know, I've been have I have the Bible on CD. And the part that I'm listening to right now is back under the law. We're talking about Leviticus and Deuteronomy and numbers and all of that. And I listen to all of the sacrifices. You know, people, we think we got it bad. You know, when you go back there and you read what those children of Israel back under that old covenant, what that law was all about, how they lived and how the Yahweh was not playing. See, he gave them a law and I'm gonna tell you, and the, one of the speaker, that was Dr. Rhonda Brazil went through it uh, on the, uh, Tuesday and she talked about how the, that law was always a remembrance of the knowledge of sin. See, was, it kept them minutely aware that they were sinners because every single thing they did, they had to have a sacrifice for it. everything. If you were ignorant about something, you had to do it. You have to have a, have a sacrifice for ignorance. See, if you were jealous, you had to have a sacrifice for jealousy. And I'm telling you, and Yahweh didn't play back there. When he said something, he meant it. When he told them to do this, that, or the other, or you'll be stoned or not, he meant it. See, this was not, and I says, why was it like that? And these are the thoughts roaming around in my head as I'm listening to it, you know, and Yahshua said, because he, this was that law back there, and I can't, I know I can't really get into it, but that law back there was a physical law, but that physical law was going, to, was pointing up to a spiritual law that Yahweh was going to keep, give us, and now that physical law was set up, so they couldn't keep it, they had, they had to continue, they were continuously sinning. Continuous, that altar of sin sacrifice, the blaze of it and the fire of it never went out, never. And the previous speaker, Dr. Edward Yule, he was beginning to go into that portion of it. See, where the Messiah, see, all of those sacrifices, when, you think, when I think about this purpose Yahweh set up, uh, he set it up all the way back there instituting something because he's got this purpose that he's going to draw out. And in this purpose, he's already set up salvation. He's already designed it, declared it. So he's got to set up a situation of jeopardy right from the very beginning, from Adam. We're all under that condemnation of death and sin right from the beginning. He set it up. See, but he's got this magnificent purpose. And this purpose, as Dr. Kenley said in this book here, he said, there is a way out of this despair. 
this 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 death state that we're in there's a way out of this we're in it now but he's the way and the truth and the life all we got to do is partake of it and for us those who he's actually given this understanding to given us an ear to hear a desire to know see those that he said we are we got the best of it all sitting here we don't even know the scripture paul talked about we have this treasure in earthen vessels speaking of the holy spirit that's being poured that has been poured out into the vessel or the man himself but yahweh set up all of that back there pointing to the one true savior pointing to the fact that they need a savior if they didn't have a sacrifice back there, they would be pitiful. It would be all over for them. But if they did wrong, they had a sacrifice to atone for the sin. So the Messiah comes in fulfilling all of the sacrifices. And I'm telling you, when you're back there reading or you're listening to the law back there, as I as I was said, I've been doing on those, those Bible uh, CDs, you know, it's like, if a man do this, he should do that. If a woman does this, she should do this. If, the, if whoever do this, then take a bullock here, take a turtle dove here, take this kind of, take this, take that, take it to the priest. He's, it was a bloody killing all the time. Then the Messiah comes in and as said, you might as well go ahead and just pick it up first. I'm, I know I'm moving fast here, but First, let me have the scripture, Isaiah 46. I want that read. I do want it read. And then I want you to go over there and just pick it up right where Dr. Yule was at over there. But I think I want you to go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter or 10th chapter, I believe it is, where he talks about sacrifices and burnt offerings. There would is, thou wouldest not. I believe that's over in Hebrews 10. But let me have Isaiah first real quick. Isaiah 46 and nine. Uh, yes. Remember the former things of old, for I am Yahweh and there is none else. I am Yahweh and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now listen, he said his counsel shall stand. So therefore, what we're not talking about somebody else's counsel. Dr. Ken, I remember mean, when I came to this scripture, I heard a speaker say before, we're not talking about the eumenical council, you know, he has the churches and all that stuff. We're talking about Yahweh's council, what he dictated. That shall stand. Yahweh's word don't go out and return void. When he said it'll stand, it will stand. So he said, my council shall stand. Read. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And he will do all my pleasure. He's talking about his pleasure, not mine, not yours. He shall do all my his pleasure. Read. Calling a ravious bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Mm -hmm. Yet I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. Mm -hmm. I have purposed it. I will also do it. I love that scripture. See, I've, I purposed it and I will also do it. This is what Yahweh stands. So it gives me comfort to know that Yahweh is solid and what he said is going to take place exactly like that. I want to be on board with that. So he called or set up this entire situation for Yahshua the Messiah to come in and to be that salvation or that atonement, see, for salvation. He set that up. So all of those turtle doves and bullocks and everything else that they had to bring, those live animal flesh that they had to bring in order to have salvation for themselves, Yahshua the Messiah came in and fulfilled all those things. Now go over there to Hebrews, if you will. Hebrews 10 and 1. Okay. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now that's what I was just saying. See, they had to endure that year by year. See, day by day, they're out there giving up sacrifices. But those sacrifices can never make them perfect. Read. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers once purged 
should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. You see that? See, every single year, see, because he's talking about the fact that the high priest went in into uh, on the day of atonement once a year to atone for sacrifices, see. But he's saying that is remembered. It's not anything that they just, oh, well, we're done with that. See, no, every year it was continuous. Go ahead, read. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now listen, when you're listening and reading over there into the Bible, when, um, up there when they were doing, uh, under the law, when they're doing all those sacrifices, you say, well, he must have really loved this. This must have been satisfying to Yahweh. See, the, the way he set it up with them and told Moses, see, and they better do it or else. They were under strict bondage with that. See, he said over here in Hebrew, see, sacrifices and burnt offerings, thou wouldest not. He had had his field with that. See, it wasn't that that was going to do the job. Go ahead, read, please. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Mm -hmm. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, he didn't have no pleasure in those burnt offerings and those sacrifices. But then said he, now, Brenda, is that, I'm trying to get over here to the 10th chapter. Is that, uh, that was 10 and what scripture? What? 10 and 7. 10 and 7. Sacrifice and burnt, and you see what I'm saying? Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written to me to do thy will, O Yahweh. See, this is Joshua the Messiah. Go ahead, please read. Eighth verse, above mm -hmm. when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Mm -hmm. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O Yahweh. Now he see, taketh lo, away. I come to do thy will. See, when Yahshua Messiah came in, see, he came lowly. See, to do thy will. In the volume of the book he talked about, we know back over there in the Old Testament portion, that's your volume or your large portion of the book. You see what I'm saying? He says, but lo, I come to do thy will, O Yahweh. Read. He taketh away the first. That what is the may... first? The first what? The first covenant. See, that's talking about, then you got to go over there to Jeremiah 31 and 31. See, what well, he said, behold, the days come that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with thy fathers when I brought them by the hand out of the hand of, out of the land of Egypt. You see what I'm saying? So now, as we say down here at this school, see if it's a new covenant, then it has, it means that it's not the same as it was back then. It's not like the old, but this is a new covenant. He said, he take it away the first, why? That he may establish the second, the second what covenant? So you have on this chart here that we're looking at all of that. And that looks like that. And we just recently, someone who brought it out, carnal ordinances. If we think about the 10 commandment law. Look, there were 613 laws and ordinances, if you will. You see what I'm saying? 613. And Yahweh had, them, had, had it so that they had to adhere to every last one of them. It was impossible for them to keep it. So therefore, they constantly were sending back there. See, and it looks like it's just a little nice, little clean, rolled up thing. See, but it was a bloody mess back there all the time with those sacrifices that were being uh, offered up. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was bondage, if you will. You see, Yahweh set this thing up because he had to move that out of the way. And as this chart is saying here and showing how that all of that that was back there, all of that, I'm telling you, it gave me new insight to sit and listen to this. I guess I never really, I read, I would read scriptures here, Christian scripture there, but day in and day out, I'm back and forth to work and I'm listening, going from one chapter to another. All of that that was going on back there, he nailed it to his cross. You see what I'm saying? Took it upon. In other words, he was that fully complete one sacrifice that all of that had to be put upon him. You see what I'm saying? That is, it is that body that he's talking about. This body, this is what he came into the world to do. I see the five minute bill, bell, but go ahead and finish reading the last portion of this. 
sorry, uh, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yahshua the Messiah once for all. See, once for all. Go ahead, read. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. It can never take it away. It's like this is so, it's so clear how Yahweh has brought this out to us. It could never take away their sins. Read. But this man. After this he... man. We're talking about Yahshua the Messiah. This one. A specially prepared body. See, he appeared like sinful flesh, but he was not. He was without gown, without sin. You see what I'm saying? This man, read. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of Yahweh. There you from, go, read. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Mm-hmm. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. There you go. Read. Whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith Yahweh, mm -hmm. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And their sins and iniquity, see, he did the whole, he did the whole thing. He completed it. He finished it. And when we accept him as our savior, accept and believe that he did it. That's what he said. He said, if you will believe that I did it, see, if you believe who I am, see, you will be saved. See, if you accept him as your savior, and that he did the work, you will be saved. You call on that name. He told the previous speakers talked about that name. The first speaker talked about how you, there is none other. Even Dr. Kinley himself, who had this vision, who was told to present this to us, had to say, you can't even be saved in my name. You can't be saved in this, that, and the other. The only name we can be saved in Yahshua's side. He's our only true ark that we must be in at the end of this age, just as they had to be in that ark at the end of that age. You see what I'm saying? We don't have the chart right in front of us, but time is out. I'm, I'm so happy, so honored to even be able to say anything. And I just wanna encourage everybody as I know that Yahshua encourages me day by day to stay in this gospel, be fulfilled in this gospel. Be complete in the gospel. Be satisfied in the gospel of Yahshua Messiah. He is that Holy Spirit who is the comforter, who will truly give us all that we need in these last terrible times that we're in, prophetic seconds of this world. And if we continue to look for him, he will always be there to give us the peace and the comfort that we need. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to have anything to say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Nelson, for, for that beautiful testimony. We wanted to thank all of our speakers for tonight, as well as thank our visiting brothers and brethren and uh, class members for joining us. We hold classes, Zoom classes, every Tuesday and Thursday from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And on Sundays from 3.30, excuse me, 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Can we all stand in our heart and mind for doxology? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our sovereign, belong glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.